Hi, this is Cindy Shabley from the Web Seller Circle. This presentation is about how to improve your photos and drive traffic into your listings. Your challenge as a seller is to get such a good photo that your picture shows up in this coveted featured seller position. Notice that that seller even has a link into their store listing from that photo. Now you may not sell in the electronics category or the clothing category or one of the other categories on eBay. Your products may display in this more traditional format, but it's still the same principle. How do you get eyeballs to see your listings? And that's what we're going to talk about in this presentation. eBay did a study recently about how good quality photos affect click-through rate. They came up with a formula and they studied how people are interacting with photos. As part of this study, it did prove that good quality images or images image features have the power to predict click-through rate. They have proven without a doubt that it is important for you to have a good quality photo. But here is the real game changer. The conclusion of this white paper was that perhaps eBay should look at its algorithms and elevate or promote images that have a higher quality over the bad images if eBay decides to implement this kind of algorithm. No longer are we going to just get away with mediocre pictures. So what is a quality image? In the white paper, eBay came up with a mathematical formula to be able to rate brightness and contrast. And that, you know, may be a little bit out of our range to figure out exactly what this mathematical formula is. But I can tell you what, they, once they have the formula, it's not going to be that hard for them to transition it into their algorithms, which means essentially that it's no longer going to be acceptable to have poor images. So here are three things that we need to focus on to improve our pictures. First one is sharpness or clarity. How sharp is that image? It can't be kind of fuzzy. It needs to be a good sharp picture. Brightness or exposure. How well did we expose that image and how much data or information is there available? Color contrast and the like. And finally, the contrast itself. The blacks versus the whites or the light areas versus the dark areas. These all affect how good the image is when it's on display. So let's break these three things down and see what we can do to improve each one of those. The first one we're going to talk about is sharpness. Now sharpness is affected by a number of different elements. First one is the lens itself, the physical lens. Now there might not be anything you can do to change this at this point other than buying a better quality camera. I'm not going to suggest you go running out and buy the best optics available, but if you are in the market for a new camera, you do definitely want to ask that salesperson or do some research and get the very highest quality lens that you can get in your budget range. What I'm going to talk about today really isn't about that. What I'm talking about is how the lens interacts with the subject or the distance between the lens and the subject. And then we're going to talk about a thing called depth of field. And that's essentially how much is in focus. And that's affected by what's called the aperture opening or how wide or closed your lens is. And finally, the other thing that affects sharpness that we have control over is what's referred to as the film plane or the camera position uh, as opposed to uh, the 
the item. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. Well, let's talk about how the lens interacts with the subject simply by how close or how far away you are from the item or the lens is, excuse me. So essentially, uh, what I'm talking about is when you're really close up, that's referred to as macro. And when you're standing back and you're using your lens glass, you're using that little dial or you're, you're, you're moving the lens to get closer, that's referred to as zoom or zooming in. And the surprising thing about macro versus zoom is that it changes the dimension or the appearance of dimension in the item. And it also can change what's referred to as depth of field, what's in focus in front of and behind your main subject. Now this may be a little bit hard to see, but when you get in close and you're in macro, your item is gonna look a little bit rounder and fuller. And surprisingly, when you move in physically closer to that item, you get in close, you're gonna have a greater depth of field or area of focus. Now, if you notice here on this, this one picture, we're mainly focusing in on this seam right here. And it's, it's uh, focused all the way down to the backdrop, what it's sitting on. And you can see the fabric there. You can see a couple of pins are all, uh, one, this one red pin down here is very sharp. And as we travel up, we start losing depth of focus or, or focus and, and depth of field. And here, you know, I stood back and what happens when you zoom in on an object is it sort of flattens the field. And surprisingly, what happens is we lose a sharpness or depth of field. So if you look at this picture, you'll see that we still have the sharpness on the seam, but we're losing it in the fabric. And as we travel up and out, all of these pins are out of focus. And that can be really crucial when you're moving in closer, you're photographing a small item. And while we're talking about depth of field, there's another component that affects depth of field. And that is your aperture opening, how wide open your lens is or how much light it's letting in. This is rated on your lens by f-stops. And what these are, are essentially how the leaves in the lens open and close to let in light. If you ever pulled apart a, a lens, you would see that it has many pieces of glass. Some of them are concave, some of them aren't. All of these pieces of glass are finely ground and placed to create a image. And the funny thing about that is that they interact with how wide open or how much light is let in through the lens using these leaves in the lens. It's a law of light and optics that we're not going to get into, but just essentially know that a lens that is wide open is going to have a different amount of focus or depth of field than one that is closed so much that it's almost a pinhole. Now a wide open lens is, re is referred to as an f2, f2.8. Most likely your lens on your camera might be an f4 or an f5.6. Now that's a wide open lens. And then on the other end, and this is kind of opposite because it's a bigger number, but it means it's smaller maybe f16 or f11, that indicates that the lens is closing. And again, if it's wide open versus if it's really closed, it changes the properties of the image. And let me show you a real quick sample of how that changes. Here is a sample of two different lens openings. The first one you'll see is this one at f 3.5. In other words, I've opened up the lens wide open and look what you're seeing. It's sort of fuzzy. There's very shallow depth of focus there. It loses focus really quickly and becomes fuzzy. On the other side, I tried 
closing down the lens to f22 and look at how sharp this picture is it travels all the way through the image all the way to the back almost fully sharp so you can see lots of detail in this little cast iron church so which one is your buyer more likely to like they're going to want to see the sharper image so again that's a small lens opening it's a small lens opening that gives me a greater depth of field. When you're trying to learn this, it's kind of hard because it's opposite. Do remember that the larger number is the smaller lens opening and the smaller number is the bigger lens opening. So how do you set that on your camera if you have a mode dial, uh, an aperture setting? It, on a Nikon or a lot of these cameras, it will be indicated by an A. And when you change that mode dial to the A, your camera is going to take care of the other elements of the picture to make sure it's exposed rightly. But you change it to A, and then there's usually a dial either on the back of your camera, and on my camera, it's right by my shutter. There's a little dial that I can roll and change the f-stops. And speaking of my camera, it's a Canon. So instead of A, like the Nikons and some of the others, it's an AV. That stands for your aperture changing. Now, if you have a fully automatic camera and you don't have these settings, not all is lost because there is another setting that you can change to help you get a deeper or wider depth of field. Understand that the settings on your camera all work in synchronicity with each other. So when you set the aperture, your camera in the background is going to set the appropriate shutter speed to allow the correct amount of light to come in and expose the picture. Think of it kind of like a funnel. The more wide open the funnel spout is, the quicker the liquid runs through it. And it's the same way with lenses. The more open the lens is, the more light goes through, and the quicker the sensor is exposed to light. And the smaller the opening, the slower the light travels through that funnel to expose the sensor. So what your camera needs to do is if you've got a small opening, it needs to have a longer exposure time, just as if liquid was traveling through a small opening in a funnel. So let's go back and take a real quick look at this image that I showed you a minute ago. The one that I took at f3.5 only took a 30th of a second to expose. But when we went to F22, that really small opening, it took 13 seconds to expose it correctly. So I definitely had to have it on a tripod, but do know that it does take longer to expose the image. So a couple of things you need to keep in mind here is if you're going to close down the lens, you're going to have a slower shutter speed, which means a blurry picture if you don't put your camera on a tripod. Now, if you aren't going to put your camera on a tripod or for some reason you cannot put your camera on a tripod, you can do one of two things and you probably want to do them both. First, if your camera is a newer camera, you have what's referred to as image stabilization. Be sure that image stabilization is turned on. It's usually referred to as IS. You may have an IS on and off. That is image stabilization. So turn it on. Now the other thing that you may want to change is a thing called ISO to help you get a sharp picture. 
Now ISO is kind of the third part of the equation when we come to synchronicity. We talked about the funnel and how light traveled through that lens and how the smaller the opening, the longer the exposure we needed to expose that sensor correctly. ISO is an old film standard. ISO or ASA is how film used to be rated in terms of how sensitive it was to light. Now if you've ever seen any of those old Victorian pictures, maybe you have some from your grandparents or your great-grandparents, where they're sitting in a parlor and they're, they're looking very stern and very formal. Now when the photographer took that picture, they, quite likely they had to expose the film or have that lens open for a couple of minutes. And the reason why people aren't smiling is because it's very hard to hold a smile for a couple of minutes. And to add to that, some photographers actually strap their subjects into their chairs to keep them still while they were being photographed. Kind of like a trip to the dentist. Fast forward, and when I first started into photography, one of the first big breakthroughs that I experienced was this thing called 400 ASA or ISO film. This film was so sensitive that we didn't have to use a flash to go take a picture inside a house or in the evening under ambient light. It was a big breakthrough and it was very exciting. So that was a faster ISO film. Now, when the engineers came to creating digital cameras, they needed to have some way to tell that sensor how sensitive to light or how much light or how to react with the light when it hit the sensor. And so the engineers essentially used the same kind of rating that they used with film. Here's an example of ISO. Now most cameras default to one or 200 ISO when you're taking a picture. And that can leave a kind of dark picture if you don't have enough light. As, the, as you change the ISO number to a higher number, which means that the sensor needs less time to get a good proper exposure of the item. Now, I generally would not recommend that you leave your ISO way up to 8 or 1600 all the time. Because just like with the film cameras, the trade-off with that 400 speed film was that we got what was referred to as grainy pictures. The same thing kind of happens with this setting as well. Without getting too technical, the the photons on the, the sensor overheat and globs of pixels kind of stick together and you get what is referred to as noise. It kind of looks grainy when you enlarge it. So especially for printing, I would never really recommend that you use these higher ISO numbers. But we can get away with a lot more when we're talking about projecting it on a computer screen because a lot of those little nuances get lost and that that pixelation or that noise gets lost so we don't have to worry about it too much. But what I'm trying to drive home here is by changing the sensor's sensitivity to light or your ISO, it means that if you don't have a tripod and your image stabilization isn't giving you a good sharp picture, try changing the ISO. But back to those folks who have an all automatic camera, this is one way you can change your camera's 
f-stop setting because if you move the ISO up your camera is going to have to adjust those other two settings the shutter speed and the f-stop they're going to have to move them or close them down which is exactly what you want to do let less light in because your sensor is more sensitive to light and you're going to get a better depth of field. Now the other thing to consider is less theory, maybe a little bit under, easier to understand than f-stops and shutter speeds and ISOs, is just a simple one. Now, of course, photographers can make it really kind of complicated because they have, on some cameras, there are lenses you can actually up, adjust up and down and backwards and forwards. Uh, and change the film plane. But what I'm talking about here is simply, are you shooting straight? Look at a level. Most, most tripods now have levels on them. Are you shooting level? Is your camera straight on to the subject? Or are you cattywonka? Are you shooting up or down or crossways? Look at your camera and your position and how you're holding that camera before you snap the shutter. If you're holding it straight on, you're going to get a greater depth of field from the main point that you're focusing on. And that's what you want, a good sharp picture. And that's what we're really trying for with these, these product photos. All right, moving on. The next thing we want to talk about is brightness or exposure. In other words, having a really well exposed image with lots of good darks and lots of bright whites. This is very important and it will affect the, the appearance of sharpness as well as just looking good on paper, so we should say, or on the computer. The first thing we're going to talk about is exposure compensation. And this is a setting on your camera. Everybody has it. Well, I would say at least 99% of cameras have this anyhow. If you look either in your command menus inside the LCD screen or on your camera, you may see a little button that has a square box with a plus and a minus in it. That's your exposure evaluation control. And if you press that, oftentimes your camera will have a dial either on the camera top or on the side, or like on my camera, it's, it's a little dial right by my shutter button where I can move the dial to change the exposure compensation as I hold the button down. Now it'll show on the screen or the LCD screen what I'm dialing so I can see in this case I'm dialing a plus one exposure. Now what does that do? Well you have to understand a little bit about what your camera is doing when it's trying to determine how to take the picture or expose the picture. So when you click the shutter halfway down your camera starts looking around at the whole picture that it's going to expose and it may see bright white area it may see a black area, it may see some tones in between, and what it tries to do is it reads that whole area and essentially tries to bring it all into one good exposure. And mathematically, how the engineers set this up is that they ask the camera to take all those whites and all those blacks and all those mid-tone colors and try to expose them into what in photography is referred to as an 18% neutral gray. Now, you don't have to worry about the mathematics behind it, but what you do need to know is that your camera essentially is trying to meter everything and tone everything into one gray area. 
And for the most part, this works unless we get into some extremes. And that's what we're doing in product photography. Oftentimes we're shooting against an all white background, an all black background, an all blue background. Whatever you've chosen to use as your background might be a solid color. Well, your camera reads that whole solid color and it tries to compensate for it. So if it was an all black background, it would try to lighten that black up to gray or if it was an all white background it would try to tone that white background into a gray and that can be a problem when we're trying to get that nice white crisp color background and exposure compensation can help you kind of tell the camera or trick the camera into changing that exposure and getting those colors you want so here's an example of what I'm talking about. I took the, these two cast iron churches and I shot them against an all gray background. And the picture in the middle is the normal shot. This is the one the camera metered thought that it was, you know, it was okay. Now, as you can see, we've got a nice gray background. It's perfectly exposed, but guess what? Our brown churches are all dark and muddy. It's not that great a picture. So when I see this in my LCD monitor, what I can do is I can say, okay, what I want to try is maybe overexposing the image. And you can see the one here is slightly overexposed. Now I might want to do a whole series of these and try, you know, half a stop, a third stop, one stop, two stops, and just see which one works the best. Now, if you're not that into photography, you may not know which way to go. Well, you can certainly do what's referred to as bracketing the exposures. Try one at minus and one at plus and see which one looks the best. Which brings me to my next part of the presentation. When you look at your LCD monitor, you probably have noticed that it looks different depending on how the light's hitting it. If you're out in a sunny situation, it's almost impossible to see that LCD screen. If you're in the dark, that LCD screen pops up and is vibrant. So how do you know what's the good exposure by just looking at the LCD screen? That's when you use a histogram. What a histogram is, is a graph or a tool that can help you determine if you have a good exposure. There are two places you can find a histogram. The first one is in your camera. And you may have come across this where it just shows a little tiny thumbnail of the picture and there's this big ugly graph next to it. Most people's first reaction is to turn that graph back off so they can see the whole picture. However, you don't want to turn the graph off. You can always zoom in to see if the picture is in focus. But the first thing I want to know, even before if it's sharp, is did I get a good exposure? And that's what this histogram is telling me, if I got a good exposure or not, by the values across this graph. So even if I'm in bright sunlight and I can't really see much detail in the picture, I can see whether or not I got a good exposure or if I've got enough information written onto the card to get a good picture later on. Now this histogram information is recorded in what's referred to as the metadata on your picture. And this metadata travels with your picture no matter where it goes. And that has a good side and a bad side. It might be that if eBay goes ahead and starts elevating good quality pictures in their algorithm, it might be that they do so by reading the histogram in the metadata that's uploaded with your picture. But Let's not really worry too much about that right now. The, the good side is that 
the histogram data is available to you in your photo editing software. Now for this demonstration, what I'm using is Google Picasa. So if you don't have photo editing software that you know how to access the histogram with, or you don't feel comfortable with your current photo editing software, or you don't have any at all, I would strongly recommend Google Picasa. It's a fairly robust piece of software that is offered for free. And I, I really love it. It's very simple to use. It's very visual and it can give you this histogram information that is going to be so valuable in getting your photos properly exposed. So to find it, just do a uh, Google search for Picasa, P-I-C-A-S-A, and it'll take you right to the download. It just takes a few seconds to download and you'll have it on your computer. And yes, it does work with Mac as well as Windows. So this is a histogram and this is how you read them. What you generally want is lots of good value or lots of peaks here in the middle of the histogram. The shadow area over pointing towards this way is the darks, the blacks, the dark tones. And the highlight areas moving over this way are the whites. Now with a printed photograph, you generally don't want to have too many blown out whites or too much black over here. And this might be a fairly good histogram for printing an image. However, with the online photos, we actually do want a little bit of white pop and a little bit of black, good saturated black. That said, this histogram is overexposed. You see all the values over here on the one side, how there's very little color information or very little information at all. And we've just got a big spike over here. In fact, when I took the picture and looked at the LCD screen, I'll bet the histogram actually showed me what was called the blinkies. This whole white area was blinking red at me. Um, it meant that it was way overexposed. There is no value to pull out of this to make a very good print. And it's also not very good for internet use either. There is just not enough blacks and not enough colored saturation here to get a good picture. This histogram indicates that the image is underexposed. There's certainly lots of color information here. We've got lots of peaks, but it's all over on one side. And that is telling me that it's just too dark. It's not going to display well. Do notice we got just a teeny tiny bump here and see we've, what it's reading are these white spots from the, from the glare of a flash. And that's what, it's, that's what that white is about. But we've got no information in the lighter tones here. So this is telling me that it is underexposed. Here is a, a really fairly good histogram. Now I want to say about histograms to remember that there is no exact right or wrong histogram. Histograms are kind of like snowflakes. Each histogram is unique. But what we're trying for is an average. What I'm reading here on this histogram is we've got a light white background and it's showing me I've got lots of white over here, lots of white value. So that's that means that I've got my, my good white background. I do have some information in here, some color information, but do notice that this isn't a very colorful item that we're taking a picture of. And we also got really good saturated blacks. So this is a pretty good histogram and this will display really well online. Here's another histogram. And you see we've got values all the way across the histogram. We've got good color information. And I would say, yeah, this will display really well online also. So you see we've got two different histograms that are considered good, and both of them will work for selling online. So to review, one, this one on top is too light. We've got too much information on the one side here, on the light side. And 
it tapers off into nothingness. There's not enough information to pull out a good exposure there. This one's too dark. There's too much information over here on the dark side. Not enough whites. This one is just right. We've got peaks and valleys all the way across the histogram. That means that we've got saturated blacks, good whites, and it's a good all around exposure. Make sense? Good. Now it's your turn. What does this histogram mean? If you said it was good, you're right. We've got a histogram that goes all the way across, which indicates that it's a good exposure. We're not getting a whole lot of colors in here because our midtones in here because there's not a lot of variety of colors. We're shooting a red bag against sort of a grayish background. This histogram is okay. I think this bag would display really well online. It's a fairly average histogram. It's a go. What does this histogram tell us? Too light. Yes, there is just not enough information here to pull out a good picture. Reshoot it. It's way too light. What's this histogram tell us? Too dark. Now, we've got plenty of inf color information here. We've even actually got a little pop here at the very end, some, some whites. Now, this is telling me that this histogram is too dark. On the side here is that this histogram is too dark, but do notice I've, I've got lots of saturation here. I've got lots of peaks and valleys here, which means that there is good color available to me if I know how to get it out of the picture. And that's where photo editing software comes in. And using the Google Picasa tuning tab, I can change the highlights and shadows and as I'm doing it watch the histogram and kind of flatten or even it out and bring values into the blacks and the whites and improve the color of the photo. So I'm simply not hitting it with a sledgehammer. I'm just very gently moving the, the slider bars and watching the histogram as it goes. And I'm improving the picture in just half a second. Working with solid color backgrounds, all white backgrounds, all black backgrounds, uh, all blue backgrounds can be a bit of a challenge uh, it, looking at the histograms because they pick up that solid color and display that solid color as part of the histogram equation. I know that the industry standard is for those all white backgrounds. So I wanted to address looking at a histogram with the all white backgrounds and talking a little bit about that. So what does this histogram say to you? Well, it actually has got value all the way across almost. We're missing a, a little bit of black and it sort of flattens out at the white. Now, the thing about this is that it's shot against an all white background and it's displaying as gray and sort of flattening out the whole look. But we have lots of good color saturation here, don't we? So what we can do is move the slider bars and move the histogram and change the value of the picture. Now, as a result, we have a much more colorful picture. We may not have an all white background, but we certainly have a big improvement. The reason why you don't have an all white background is because we didn't check the exposure evaluation in the camera and slightly overexpose it so we could further manipulate it in our photo editing software. You know what? There's, there's only so many hours in the day. There's only so many things you can remember at once. And doesn't this look fine the way it is? It, it looks like it was shot against a gray background. The base is highlighted. It looks really nice and clean. And I would be happy to use it in a, a product photo. Here's another histogram. What's it tell you? Well, what it tells us is we've got lots of good blacks, lots of good whites, 
and nothing in the middle. And oftentimes what I see when I see these kind of photos and it's clothing and bags and, and things like that uh, shot against a, a solid background, what's happening is that people aren't paying attention to their histograms and they're going way too far on one side or the other. And a, a navy blue bag like this, I've seen them displayed as almost gray, but on the description it'll say navy blue. And the and the buyer, are they going to really believe that that's a navy blue bag? Probably not. There's going to be a disconnect there. Instead of just using your own computer monitor and your own eyes as judgment, because remember, everybody's computer monitor displays differently. And unless you're using software to help you calibrate your monitor correctly, you're not necessarily going to have the same display that everybody else is going to see online. So using your histogram, you can bring in some value here. So what I've done is I've used the slider bars and watched the histogram to make sure I'm not losing color value. And I'm sliding the, the, the histogram over, that color information over into the midtones and bringing up this color without washing it out completely. Of course, we've got a big white spike over here. It's because I was shooting against an all white background. Now we've got detail in the color, that navy blue color, without losing all of the color from the bag itself. Uh, the, the buyer should be able to determine that this is a navy blue bag. One more for you. What does this histogram tell you? Well, it's kind of a trick question, but that we've been looking at histograms that have been very colorful, and this one isn't. It's just black and white, and that's what it's telling you, is that it is exposed correctly across the whole spectrum, but there's no color in it, and it's just black and white, and a few shades of gray. And that's correct for this picture, but that's what that meant. And I just wanted to give you another chance at seeing a different histogram. So let's start putting this all together for you. Here's a histogram. What's it telling you? Well, actually it's telling you that it's a pretty good exposure. In fact, if I was going to send this off to the printer to have prints made of it, I would be pretty darn happy with it because I don't have big peaks here. I don't have anything washed out and I'm not losing detail in my highlights. Here's the picture. It's very colorful. However, we want the very best exposure we can get. And that means pulling up just a little bit more white. To me, this is kind of like adding just a pinch of salt to the, to the recipe, just bringing it up and putting that final dash of flavor on the picture. And in this case, simply what I had to do was go on to the basic fixes and hit that auto contrast and Picasso did the work for me. You see how we've changed the, the, the flat white areas into a, just a tiny little spike. And here's the final image. Now we've got good whites, good saturated colors. It's a good picture. It's got good density or exposure all the way across the field. Now it may be hard for you to kind of see the difference. But here they are side to side. Again, both of them are acceptable, but just taking that few extra seconds to pop up that color makes a big difference in the, the, the uh, way it displays, how vibrant it is. Well, congratulations. You've just finished your crash course on exposure. So let's talk a little bit about backgrounds. But before we do, I want to remind you that on the CD is a presentation about color theory in which I go into backgrounds and talking about backgrounds in detail. So if you haven't already seen that, I would recommend that you take a look at that as well. And I don't want to repeat what I said in that presentation. So we're going to talk a little bit more about making the picture pop off the background. Now, the reason why 
white backgrounds are so darn popular and have become kind of the industry standard is because they make the subject pop out. They draw your eyes in and get you to focus on that item specifically with no distraction. That all white works really well in, in making colors look vivid and give you that good density and contrast that you need to be able to distinguish what the item is. But what about items that are kind of monochromatic or single tone colors? Here we have a, a, a couple of bags that are pretty much the same bag. It, they both look good. One displays well against a white background and you're not distracted by what's going on around it and your eyes are drawn to it. However, when we're talking about being competitive in a row of pictures, it might be adding just a dash of color to the background helps your items stand out against the competition especially if your competition is using the all-white backgrounds. So think about using a color that might complement or bring out the color of the item that you're taking a picture of and help it contrast against that background and maybe catch some eyes by doing something different than everybody else on the page. I wanted to come back to this picture that we started out with. What if you're using a neutral background? Actually, I think that this was a glass that was probably taken against a white background. And this was the best exposure that this photographer was able to get for this translucent item. It's fairly hard to take pictures of glass. And using a background like this is just sort of adding to your woes. So I wanted to kind of wrap up everything that we've learned today and, and put it into a practice for you and see if we can use the same kind of background and see if we can get a different result. So here's my Olympia beer glass against an all gray background. And what I want to do is see if I can pull that image out away from the all gray background and make it stand out a little bit. The first thing I want to do when I take the picture is to look at the histogram. And this histogram, what's it telling us? It's telling us that there are no white values here. We've got a bunch of color, but it's just right here in the midtones. Not very good blacks, actually. There are some blacks, but not that great and no whites to contrast it. And that's funny because look at the beer glass. We've actually got a lot of white there. That tells me that I need to change my camera setting, that it's reading all that gray, and maybe I need to change it a little bit and bracket the exposures and try overexposing it. Here I've tried one stop over, and you can see it's moved the histogram over a bit and we're starting to get some more whites. So what I can do, now I have a choice. I can take another picture, a half a stop more overexposed or a whole stop overexposed, or say, hey, I've got good color value here. It's time to start taking it into my photo editing software and see if I can manipulate that histogram inside of the uh, photo editing software. So what I did was I took that picture into what I generally use, which is Photoshop Elements. And using their slider bars, which are exposure and, and uh, fill light and blacks, which are very similar to the Picasa, I was able to lighten up that picture and move that, that histogram over so that I'm getting blacks and I'm getting whites. And I've pulled out the detail or the glass from the background. Got much more um, going on here. We can see the differentiation between the glass and the background. So it's not all flat there against that background. Now I could do some finishing touches here. 
And this is where practice makes perfect. The one thing that I can do while I'm taking the picture is to understand that I do want to pull that glass out from the background. And one way I can do that is with backlight. So with this particular picture, I used a onboard flash on my camera, but I knew that I wanted some backlight and a, a flash only gives you light from one direction. So I used a reflector, a silver reflector that you can get online uh, or you at your local photo store. It's just uh, about 24 inches round. You can get them in different sizes. And I held it up behind the glass out of the eye of the camera so that when the flash went off, part of it bounced off of the silver reflector and bounced onto the back of the glass. Now it may be a little bit hard to see, especially seeing this first picture looks a little bit lighter, but do notice how in the back up here at the top of the lip, the back part is starting to fade into the background. There's no good definition between the background and the glass. And this one with the reflector is, is still has definition back there on the lip of the glass. So it looks a little bit sharper. Again, it may be a little bit hard for you to see, so I, I actually cut it up and, and did a close-up of the two glasses. And again, notice that the one with the reflector, what's happened here is that it, it, it appears to be sharper. And whether it actually is or not, I'll leave it up to you to decide. But why it appears to be sharper is that there is just a little teeny tiny shadow being cast along the bottom part of the lip there from the reflector because the reflector is hitting the top of the glass and creating this little shadow. Thus it's giving the glass some dimension back there. And I do this with not just glass, but just about every picture that I take. I add a little bit of backlight or a little bit of side light to bring out the detail and sharpness. So with that said, here's the final picture using a gray background. To be honest with you, would I use a gray background to to take a picture of this, this um, fairly translucent item? Generally not. It's, it's not my style. And from what I've learned about color theory and taking pictures, I know that using a little color contrast the glass is going to help pop it out, make it more visually interesting to my potential buyer. So I would probably use a different color background. In this case, I used a, a blue background. And I think it looks a lot sharper, cleaner, and crisper against uh, the blue background. And I'm able to add a little bit more definition. So I hope that's been helpful for you as you go forward and as uh, eBay contemplates whether or not they're going to incorporate picture quality into the algorithms. Just remember as you're taking your pictures, the three things that are going to be so very important for you is making sure that your picture is sharp or the clarity of the picture. How sharp is it? How sharp does it look? And, and remember that sharpness doesn't just have to do with how sharp the, the picture is, but a number of other things, your brightness and your exposure and the contrast versus the light and dark areas as well. Use those histograms to help you get a good solid exposure and pop out those backgrounds by um, adding a little bit of black and a little bit of white. And if you don't think it makes a difference, and I actually wonder if eBay isn't already experimenting with this, uh, this notion, look at this search on my homepage. I was doing some research because I have a Bible like this that I'm going to put up for sale. And when I returned to the homepage on eBay after I did my research, here are the three similar Bibles to mine that are for sale right now. And the interesting thing is the one that's promoted is 
so much more visually interesting than the other two exact same items. I'll leave you with that. I want to thank you for watching this presentation. I hope you found it of value. And if you did, I want to mention that we have all kinds of tutorials similar to this uh, about selling online, not only about photography, but about bookkeeping, product development, selling on multiple venues, all on the web seller circle. It's available to you to watch at your leisure. The web seller circle is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So you can access the information on your schedule. This is Cindy Shevely from the web seller circle. I hope to see you there.